In this video, we're gonna take some time to go over the web architecture. So before we dive in and start doing some web programming, thought it would be important for us to make sure that we're on the same page as far as some basic information that we need to have in our toolkit before we start thinking about how we're gonna program on the web. So what we're gonna do is take some time today to look over a few things. First of all, we're gonna spend some time looking at what a client server architecture might involve. And then we're gonna talk about some of the protocols and languages used on the web. We'll spend a little time reviewing HTML and just making sure that we have a common base of some tags that we'll be seeing quite often. And then we're gonna take a brief look at three different types of web pages, a static web page, a dynamic web page, and a responsive web page. We'll spend just a little bit of time talking about the difference between programming for a GUI versus procedural programming. And we'll spend the last part of our lesson today diving in and looking at the HTTP servlet from Java, which is what we're going to spend a lot of time programming against in the next couple of lessons. So with client server architecture, we have to keep in mind that this is gonna be different than just generic application programming. Because in an application programming, you have generally one application that's up and it's running and it runs to completion and it's done. With a client server architecture, you have multiple things to consider. The first thing to think about is that you have a client that's in a diverse location or a different location than where your server is located. And so your server will be hosting the application and there'll be some communication going on behind the scenes between the two. The other thing to think about with client server architecture that's different than application programming is that with an application, you often are the only user doing something versus with a client server, you might have many clients actually working against your server at the same time. So you have to think about different aspects of how you would handle concurrency issues and things that might happen when you have multiple people trying to do things at once. When we're going forward, we'll talk about two things, the server and the client. And the first thing, when we talk about server, we're going to be focusing on the actual hardware that's hosting the application and the application itself. The server will often do things like take requests and process them, and then it will send some response back to the client. And the server also logs or reports errors, sometimes even displays an error through the client. The client will then be the user interface that's responsible for sending the request to the server. It often processes and renders whatever the server sends back, and our major client that we'll be looking at will be, of course, a web browser. And you might also encounter phone or device applications being a client against a web server. So the protocols and languages used in web programming, the main one is the HTTP slash HTTPS protocol. So you've seen this when you typed into a web page. This is, of course, the protocol, the hypertext transfer protocol that we use to communicate on port 80 when we use our browser and communicate to the server. The client will send an HTTP request and the server will send back an HTTP response. The HTTPS is of course security, which is done over port 443. And that is basically, you have to get a signed certificate from a third party provider and it encrypts your transmissions back and forth so they can't be sniffed out by web sniffers that sniff the packets. So the packets are communicated back and forth between the client and server via the TCP IP protocol. So transmission control protocol and the internet protocol. Everybody of course has an IP address and all these web servers all have IP addresses and they're communicating back and forth using those numbers and they send them in packet bursts. It's not all done at once. When we communicate back and forth, often what we'll see is that we'll use markup languages to do a lot of data manipulation and transmission that gives us the ability to display responses or handle data in a formatted manner. HTML, the hypertext markup language, is our main web language for our browser to actually have the pages display. And XHTML is just an extended version of the HTML library. And we have the extensible markup language, which is XML documents, which are often used to do things like display data or transmit data. We have our FTP, which is our file transfer protocol, which exists on port 21. So often what will happen is as a web server administrator, you would log in to your website's FTP location via port 21 and upload files to the server to be used by the application or to be downloaded by other users. Telnet is a way to connect via port 23 and a lot of times Telnet is used to get into a system like a Unix system. You could Telnet in and then be able to do things against the system. SMTP is our simple mail transfer protocol and that exists on port 25. And what that is is of course how we send our emails. And POP3, which hopefully everybody's seen some sort of POP3 at this point, you get mail retrieval that way from something like Hotmail or Yahoo Mail or something that might have a POP3 address available to you that you could then use an Outlook or some other type of web mail client to connect to that server. 
So just looking at HTML real quick, let's start out by taking a look at markup languages. Markup languages are all very similar. They basically use tags to communicate information, and so tags would have a matching end tag or would be self-closing. So an end tag means that it has a slash with the same name as the starting tag. So you see that first tag there says some tag, has some text in it, and then it has a slash some tag, which is the ending tag. Note they are case sensitive, so if you have different cases, they are not aligned, so they have to match exactly. The other one is the sum tag with the self-closing slash and greater than sign at the end. So essentially what that's saying is that this tag does not need to have a matching end tag. It basically is going to include attributes to describe whatever it's doing, or there's no data, and so it's a null tag. But we'll encounter that as we go. Tags often have attributes. So you'll see the name of the tag, and then you'll have an attribute name with equals, and then something in quotes. And that'll just be some value. So we'll see that as we start building web pages that we need to have different parameters on different tags, and we'll have those values in quotes. And tags can be nested, of course, and there's unlimited nesting. So there's just a couple tags with some attributes, and you can see that they're nested within each other. And you note that they're nested because the T tag doesn't close until down here, and the R tag is included inside of there. Some common HTML tags that we'll be using throughout the course and throughout our web programming careers would be comments. A line break. So the comments, of course, is less than, bang, dash, dash, and then whatever you want, and then dash, dash, greater than. So that comment can exist across multiple lines. The breaking, line breaking statement is just less than, br, greater than. Sometimes you'll see that self-closing as well in more formal syntax. You might see br slash greater than. Form tags basically are including sections where we're going to do some post back to the server. So we want to have a form that allows us to have an action on it, and that action will be to post. The HTML tags will wrap our code. The head tags are where we're going to have information like the title of the page, any meta information that we want to try to do for search engine optimization. We're also going to have in there scripts and styles. And then we'll have the body tags, which is where the main document code is going to take place. And the title tag, of course, is the name of the actual page that displays when you browse to it. Our first self-closing tag that we see here is an input. We'll see a lot of inputs because inputs are used to gather information, either via text or button. And so there'll be different ways that someone could put in information for us or submit information. The image tag is also self-closing, and that allows us to display images. The P tags are going to be a paragraph text tag, and the span tags are going to be where we'll put text for, you might call it a label, essentially just a single line of text. The text area tag is a block of text, and the select options select is going to be our drop down list of items, so each item will have its own option tag. All right, this seems like a great place to take a quick break, so let's take a quick break now, and we'll pick this up in the next lesson.